give you a serious presentation. I hope to give you an idea of some of the early regulation in the automobile industry and just a feel for what it was really like. Those good old days, believe me, weren't really the good old days. Uh, and it's hard to believe it was almost a century ago that glowing reports were coming from Europe extolling the virtues of a new motor vehicle, the automobile. Really wasn't very pretty. And of course the American writers picked up on it right away as they would and pretty soon the American public was reading all kinds of exciting and intriguing novels about it. And the city officials were really looking forward and had great expectations so that they could eliminate the noise and the clutter and the congestion in their cities. And the health officials were concerned about the disease-carrying flies in the cities. It was a tremendous problem in those days, 22 pounds per horse per day. So it was quite a serious problem. And the Humane Society hoped to relieve some of those horses so that they wouldn't have to work in commerce. But when that first noisy, sputtering automobile hit the American shores, the great expectations turned to great disappointment. It was unsightly. It was unreliable. What a place to get stuck. It was unpredictable. Just scared the hell out of everybody. And it was very unusual. This car used a set of reins to steer it. <laughs> and Haynes Apperson actually put this car out with the front of a horse in front of it. It was called the Horsey Horseless Carriage, and a man from Battle Creek, Michigan, named uh, Uriah Smith invented it. And he actually sold it. And here again, this man felt that eight wheels would do better than four. It was called the Octo Auto. But the automobile was really unwanted in those days by many. It was merely a carriage or a bicycle or a wagon to which they had attached a motor. They really didn't even know what kind of power they were going to use, whether steam, electric, or gas would prevail. The electric vehicle was quiet, it was easy to drive, but it had limited range. It always needed to be charged. The steam car had good speed and power, but it had to be warmed up and needed frequent watering. And for some reason, people were afraid that a steam car was going to blow up. So it was left to the gas buggy, which was noisy, dirty, smelly, and dangerous to clean up the noisy, dirty, smelly cities. And it was noisy. They even advertised to prove that it was noiseless. And it was smelly, as you can see from this cartoon. The gas buggy frightened the horse, it frightened the pedestrian, and even frightened the driver. Especially the horses. This was quite common on the early American roads, where the horse drivers would actually have to hold the horses, and later on there was regulations requiring that drivers of motor vehicles must assist in calming down the horses. The automobile created chaos wherever it went and it really didn't go very far before it broke down. And they didn't even have a fuel for it in the early days. That last item there of whiskey, one manufacturer claimed that if the engine was hot and you ran out of gas, you could use any of the above fuels plus bad whiskey. And the fuels were so volatile that if you were to take a ferry boat across and you drove your automobile, you had to empty it completely of all the gas. Then you had to put it back in with a filter drop by drop. And the Pierce Motorette, I think a lot of you may have heard of the Pierce, Pierce Aero Company, they required an oil change every 15 miles. So in 1900, the image of the automobile, the horse drivers hated it, police disliked it, city officials really wanted to ban it. The Teamsters, blacksmith, and stable workers were th felt threatened by it. Children jeered and threw rocks at it, and dogs chased it. And it was a rich man's toy. 
the average cost of a motor vehicle was three times the yearly salary of an industrial worker. So it was regulated right from the beginning. The first American legislation was a speed limit of 12 miles an hour was Hartford in 1901. Here are some others. In Boston, it was two miles an hour. Philadelphia was five miles an hour on city streets. In Saginaw, bicycles could go faster. Their speed limit was 10, the automobile was eight. And in New England, they posted a sign one year that said the speed limit is a secret and motorists breaking it will be fined $10. <laughs> These are legitimate. And there were other restrictions. They were, the motor vehicle was prohibited from the city parks in New York, Boston, San Francisco. In Eureka, Kansas, motorists driving through had to first telephone the sheriff. In Oxnard, California, a police escort was required. Siren, bell, horn, the whole thing. And in Pennsylvania, there was a movement called the Farmers Anti-Automobile League. And they wanted the motorists to shoot off Roman candles every mile, wait 10 minutes, then, then do it again. In San Francisco, the motorists must not swear on public highways. And in Chicago, women cannot drive a car if the hat they are wearing covers one eye. This was the earliest law. It was called the Red Flag Act. And this man proceeded to vehicle over in England. This really restricted the English motor, uh, motor industry. But this was actually used in America, too, especially for night driving. A man had to proceed an automobile at night with a red lantern in many states. And one of the first things that the AAA did was get out and put out signs saying, look out for the speed cops. But the speed cops were no match for the automobiles because they only had bicycles. <laughs> so they put ropes across the road to stop them. But our inventors solved that. This is a pair of scissors on the front end of that car. <laughs> so the motorists decided if they can't drive in the city, they would go out to the country. And the, that was a mistake. By 1904, there were only 141 paved miles of highway in the United States. The improved was 153,000. And of course, there was no gas station. This was one of the early gas stations. This was an improved road. <laughs> this is what they called a plank road. Some of you have seen the expression plank road. They were actually wooden roads. Sometimes there were no roads at all. You had to make your own. And sometimes the farmers would shoot at the automobilists as did the police. So you really took your life into your hands driving out in some areas of the country. But again, our vendors came through. This is a bullet, a bullet deflector for a motor vehicle. Those two fans on back are supposed to stop bullets from hitting you. <laughs> but it was the American roads that actually dictated the first type of American car, which was called the runabout. The critics like to say it would run about a mile and stop. And that probably was your great-great-grandfather's Oldsmobile. I hate that commercial. Even the Oldsmobile didn't really make it very far. But as roads improved, the motorists got worse. And all of a sudden, you had a bunch of speed demons on the road, and regulation came hard and fast. This is some of the, the rules of the road by that Farmers Anti-Automobile League. I don't know if you can see them, the slide's not quite that good. But this says where the driver is supposed to pull off the road and uh, cover his car with a blanket that corresponds with the scenery. The speed limit, this will be a secret, you've heard that one. Uh, on approaching a corner, a curve, the driver must stop. They were just ridiculous laws, but they existed. There's the shooting of the Roman candles. That gives you a good indication of what the country folk thought of the automobile. That's what the automobilists thought of the country people. One of the worst was William K. Vanderbilt. Willie K., as they called him, was probably one of the worst speeders of that, that day and used a foreign uh, race car. But he was willing to pay for his wild ways. 
And the farmers were usually alerted when he was driving in their vicinity. They used to push livestock out on the road because he would pay handsomely. That's a true story. The farmers also learned that if they improved some of those mud holes, they could get some extra money that way. They felt that the rich had to pay for the privilege of driving a car. And the automobile was city bred. It was a rich man's toy. Worse than that, he was driving a foreign automobile, usually foreign racers. And one of our famous presidents even had an anti-automobile feeling. He claimed that nothing has spread the socialistic feeling as much as the automobile, although he drove one himself. There was also trouble financing the automobiles, and the industry had a very difficult time. They wouldn't lend money to buy cars. And it's not surprising because I would say approximately to date, more than 6,000 different makes of cars were produced by more than 2,000 different manufacturers. Here in the state of Iowa, more than 75 different makes of cars were produced. This was the first one. This was one by William Morrison in 1889. Morrison actually sold that for $3,500. But even Morrison felt and made the statement one time that he wouldn't give a dime for the automobile. So it took men like Henry Ford who took the concept of mass production and the continuous moving assembly line to really make the automobile what it, to put it down to the price of the industrial worker. By 1914, the Model T Ford production was more than the combined total of the rest of the world. And it was affordable. Even the farmer came around to realize he could have a mechanical farm hand. And his wife found out she could get to town more often and his son found that he had a chariot for courting. Henry Ford took the one-horse town, made it congested, polluted, and dirty. Not really. He actually was responsible for really stimulating the love affair with the automobile. Everybody loved the automobile. Well, almost everybody. The clergy again criticized the automobile and claimed that it was keeping people from going to church on Sunday because of the Sunday morning drives. And of course there were parents who were concerned that the love affair with the automobile might become the love affair in the automobile. The statement here it says, Mary went riding in a motor car for a horse of trap she didn't care, but one day the chauffeur went too far so she's taken to a carriage in a pair. Those were the type of cartoons that were being published. Frederick Lewis Allen claimed that the American Revolution of Morals and Manners were the principal forces of that were Prohibition, True Confession Magazine, the movies, and the automobile. Maybe he was right. That was one of the popular songs of the day. And in the study on the typical American town, Middletown, Robert and Helen Lynn claimed that the automobiles become a house of prostitution on wheels. Not quite true. The caption there said, we want to report a stolen car. And those parents who were concerned became today's grandparents who are still concerned. But eventually by 1928, the automobile had moved into the closed car and there wasn't that much really concern about the kids anymore. Couldn't see what they were doing really. And with mass production, available fuel, and good roads, America again congested the roads, creating clutter, and created more or less a roadside economy. Most people don't realize how much economy was created. But then the depression came and just slammed the brakes on everything. And again, the automobile became a rich man's toy. There was a tremendous custom car field at that time with the Duesenbergs, the V16s. Some of those cars cost $20,000 at that time just for the chassis. But most Americans held on to their cars and sacrificed to keep them. And the automobile was extremely important as men went throughout the country searching for employment or went out to the country to get away from the ills of the city. Then the automobile was criticized for the clutter that it was creating. In 
and it did. Christ or chaos? But then again, the two-lane highways of America were just too much, and the automobile was creating congestion again. Our inventors came to the fore again. Here's an invention where you collected the exhaust gas on top of the car, then you could let it out in the country or someplace where it wouldn't be a problem, or maybe in your neighbor's yard or something like that. But by the end of the Second World War, actually a little bit before that, because the, uh, let's see, I guess your first interstate highway starts in around 1939, but by the end of the Second World War, superhighways were starting to dart America, or actually surround America, go through over and below American cities. And again, the automobile was criticized for its excesses, and it was. The cars got bigger. We were using lots of chrome, the engines, lots of horsepower. They were huge. America moved out to the suburbs. And again, the congestion just got worse. And people were concerned that the automobile was using up the natural resources. And again, we're back to the time of where there was pollution in the olden days. They're concerned again about the pollution. And there were many critics on speed. Unsafe at any speed by Ralph Nader completely changed the automobile industry. And a lot of good came from that. Then in 1966, with the motor federal legislation regulated motor vehicles, the automobile changed and has never again been the same. The auto industry was really a giant besieged. We have problems, we know we have problems. And we hope that with technology, research and development, that environmental safety and energy and consumer problems will be alleviated. But who knows what happens when we get another Arab oil embargo. The caption says your money or your way of life. So maybe we'll see scenes like this again. Back in the beginnings of the industry, we were looking at steam, gas, and electric. Today, we're still looking at things. Our inventors are looking at wind-type vehicles. Put a propeller on both ends. Why not? This is an interesting device, which is a carburetor, which is supposedly controlled by the phases of the moon. Fortunately, the patent wasn't allowed. But we are working with solar power. Who knows? Maybe someday there's something will come up. But we know there will always be vehicle regulations no matter what our source of, of fuel or, or power. The American city in 1895 was considered dirty, noisy, and smelly. Today our critics are saying the same thing, and again, the automobile is possibly responsible. I will say one thing has been solved. They've solved the collection of manure from horses in Central Park. I don't know if you can see that. It's called the nag bag. Now, I don't know if the horses will go along with that, but at least it's a step in the right direction. I guess what I'm really saying in all this is that the more things change, the more they return, remain the same. That's it. The automobile unwanted, backwards. <laughs> Thank you. Make sense to you? You did a lot of research on that kind of thing. <laughs> okay. uh, Mr. Wren has another series of slides uh, subsidiary with this. I guess we'll take a couple of moments here to set them up. If you'll just be patient. It's, not humorous patents. it's no. rather a humorous set of patents, it says. That's my business is patents. I have to get a look at them. This year is the centennial. This year or next year? Uh, the patent office. American scene. 
scaring the heck out of everybody. Again, we had that congestion. There were 18 million horses and mules in America at that time, many of them in commerce. You saw that slide before. Gee, I didn't know there were that many uh, repetitions. But they were noisy, dirty, smelly, scared the horses, created chaos. Safety, performance, traffic congestion, auto theft, comforts, convenience, and fuel economy were the problems then as, as they are today. I titled this Patents I've Met, which I'll never forget. Somehow, the inventors couldn't get away from the idea of animal power. This patent has a horse running on a tread. It's a locomotive power. This again was a mechanical horse. These all preceded the automobile. So they were thinking in the right direction anyway. Here's a, what you would call dog power, I guess. And there was a walking traction engine. There again is the first homely looking American vehicle. This was that front end by Uriah Smith in 1899, and that's the one he actually sold to the Horsey Horseless Carriage Company. Here again were the reins. This goes the other extreme. Even after the automobile came around, the inventor feels that he'll take a part from an automobile and use it in conjunction with the horse. If you notice, he's got a steering wheel there, and that steering wheel turns and puts pressure on the horse's thighs to turn them. That's what you would call a little bit of overkill, where just a little tug on a rein would probably solve the same purpose. So they went both ways. They were putting lanterns on the front of horses. This had to be the definitive tail light. <laughs> that light on the back of the horse actually had a windshield wiper tied in with it, so the swishing of the tail would keep the lights clean. And of course, when you got a car, if you lived in the suburbs or lived out in the country, it was delivered in a box. And it was up to you to actually put it together and take it out of the box and, and get it home. The box usually cost an extra 60 bucks. This inventor solved that problem. He made the box the body of the car. And here's an interesting invention. We're talking about aerodynamics. This inventor put that aerodynamic front end on the vehicle when speeds were 2 to 8, 12 miles an hour to deflect the wind. But he defeated the whole purpose by putting that huge windshield on it. You saw those early speed limits. Here's an interesting safety device in the early days which gave control of the passenger the brake. So both the driver and a brake could control, could, or the passenger could control. Just imagine you're driving and all of a sudden your passenger slams on the brakes. That's about what you're going to get. That's the reaction you would get. And one of the cartoonists had it. And this was a safety device for electric vehicles. Now some of you may remember the interlock device with the seat belt where you had to sit on the seat and it made a switch go and you had to put your seat belt on. This one, this was that concept back in 1904. Same with this one. This was a safety stop, but the problem was the roads were so bad in those old days that you were continually bouncing out of the seat and you couldn't keep the car running. And talking about bouncing up and down, if roads were that bad, this inventor had the idea, well, as long as you're gonna bounce up and down, you might as well use the the movement, he figured that bouncing up and down in a seat would actually ventilate the vehicle. This is the same idea about 10 years later. This inventor felt bouncing up and down could actually blow the horn or a siren. And later on, this one felt you could lubricate the car by bouncing up and down on it. So those motorists were all bundled up, ready to go, ready to hit the roads. That's about the way some of them look. You saw that in your grandfather's Oldsmobile. Here's an interesting concept in 1913 of using a windshield wiper. The problem was he ran it off the wheel. So that whenever you stopped at a stop street or stopped at a light, you had no windshield wiper. It's exactly when you needed it. 
a little bit of detour, detour. These people were always being lost. I mean, the motorists out in the country would, would get lost no matter where they went. So this inventor had the idea that he would hook up a road map in conjunction with the car that would ring a bell every time to turn him, tell him when to turn right or to, to turn left. And some of the inventors used the road map on the screen of the car. Most of you don't remember that. The old cars, the old cars, the olden days used to have screens that you would pull down over the windows. Here's the later device, and pretty much what we're doing today. That concept, even though it was so old, is used today in vehicle triangulation, where you can shoot a signal to a satellite, and they will give you back the information of where your car is. That hopefully will help to eliminate a lot of congestion in the cities uh, in future years. That's the kind of congestion we had. Here's a novel device for parking your car. There were many of them that would actually elevate the car up so it could move sideways. This inventor had a better idea. Just till it up on end and then move it in. And as the automobile changed, why not have a little bit of music? Radios weren't around then, so this inventor put a piano in the back seat. Quite expensive. I don't know how he would play it or, or somebody else would. This is one that the ladies will like. As long as you're out in those bad roads, bouncing up and down, you might as well take the clothes, throw them in this washing device on the running board. The bouncing up and down would agitate your clothes, and by the time you got there and turned around and came back, put fresh water in, you've got clean clothes. This inventor put in the spin drive. He put that device into a wheel. And as long as you were going to stop, might as well put something up on the manifold stove. Interestingly enough, there's a new book out now on manifold cooking for automobiles. There really is. I found this the last time I gave this presentation. The name of the book is called Manifold Destiny, and it's a cookbook just for cooking with the manifold of your car. They even had them under the seat. I don't know what they would call that. And if you went, you know, if you wanted a cold drink, this was a refrigerator that was mounted in front of the car. But just think for a minute, if, if you put a refrigerator in front of a car and you're driving, you're going to, your boiler, you know, you're going to overheat the radiator. So you're not going to go very far. You're going to need the cold drink. But as long as you're going to overheat the radiator, you might as well cook with it. Or maybe you want in the kitchen. Actually, these devices were actually sold. It was a whole kitchen that would fold out from the side of the car. You could take your paper plates, you could put them in an incinerator. You might want to take a nap. You might want to clean up a little bit. You might want to change your clothes, shine your shoes, or take care of those other problems. This one even had a lock on it like they do in the gas station. And this man felt he would put it right on the back of the car. But again, remember the motorists and the, uh, the uh, policemen who were putting the ropes across? This is the scissors to cut the ropes. Here's a novel device for the rude drivers. If you want the driver with the bright lights, you can flick them back in his eyes. Or you can say a few choice words to him if you want to with this device. I'm sure everybody would use that. Or if you wanted to keep them away, just use these spikes on the front of your car. <laughs> or you can go one step further. This is a tear gas device that's put in. <laughs> and again, if the automobile is being shot at by the farmers and the police, that's the bullet deflector. But they also help the police. They had special devices for the policemen. Here's a police grab. Now, police cars aren't very big, so imagine this thing grabbing onto a big Cadillac. All the crooks had big Cadillacs or Packards. So just rip the heck out of the car. And here's another thing. The pedestrians were such a problem. This device would actually pick up the pedestrian and wrap him in a blanket. That's <laughs> actually sold that device. He really looks like he's a bad shooter. Here's a later device where you not only, if you should hit the pedestrian, you could trap him on the front of your car so you could drive him to the hospital. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
and there were cameras mounted in front or in back to at least uh, you know see who was tampering with your car or who might be approaching your car. And there were lots of uh, traps to catch thieves. And they want the, these inventors wanted to catch them and trap them right in the automobile. These are devices to catch them and hold them. This one just grabs them. As you can see, it's grabbing them around the leg. This one grabs them up a little bit higher on the leg. And as long as you're at the steering wheel, you could say your rosary with this steering wheel. <laughs> Or with this steering wheel, you could actually heat your hand. It had light bulbs in it to keep your hands warm. And this one, you could light your cigarette in it, but imagine trying to light that, your cigarette with a flame while you're steering your car. <laughs> and with this one, you could monitor your heart. This is the late, one of the later patents. So the automobile was all things to all people. And of course, some people wanted their car smelling good. With plenty of deodorizers. I can't figure out how this artist missed the most important hand signal of all in his drawing. <laughs> but that's the hand signal air freshener. Here's a novel device for those people with a convertible. It's a special top that once you put your convertible top down, you can put another top up over your head. Another overkill. And here's a dandy little device, and it is for automobiles. It's supposed to help you catch bees or insects or something that might be in the car with you. And again, as long as you're catching things, this one caught the exhaust. Here's a device to keep the woman's skirt down. It's a real big seller on the market. This is an interesting device. I don't have the, the good artwork on it, but it was an air conditioner that you were supposed to tow along at the end of your car, in the back of your car, and stick a hose through the window. Weird, weird. And the concept of a telephone in your car is nothing new. Before, all you had to do was just stick this pole up, hook on to the telephone wires, and make your telephone call. They even had them inside of the car. This guy even had a pay telephone inside the car. And it is for a car. So the concept of safety, performance, traffic congestion, auto theft, comfort, convenience, comfort, as you can see, has gone through the auto industry. Today we're looking at our air-propelled cars. Again, that's that land-propelled vehicle. But that, the concept of solar power, this is shown in a 1930 cartoon for a steam vehicle which would operate by collecting the solar power and then converting it to steam. And of course, we're working on solar power cars today. I guess what I'm saying is new ideas solve old problems, and old ideas solve new problems. Again, you saw that one. And the patents I've met, I hope some of them you'll never forget. And it was supposed to end with things are always and never the same. <laughs> Thank you again, and that's it. I apologize that I didn't know I had.